citizens of Flint, Michigan received eviction notices for unpaid contaminated water bills. Wow. Flint politicians hate black people more than Michael Moore's makeover. Can I get a holla for some holla? New title idea, which made me laugh. Dumping on 30 Rock, the big tree in my yard, made me think of it. On top of Alec Baldwin losing his surging sense of purpose. Bill de Blasio threatening Trump. Send us Central America's finest and we'll sue. Machete ban bills weren't included in the Green Deal. Sanctuary cities will welcome all the illegal aliens Trump sends in their direction because MS-13 will prevent gays from gentrifying their fixer-upper neighborhoods again. Sounds like a smart revenue model to increase quality of life to me. I asked my daughter, Matilda, what happens in Rocky IV? She says, Apollo dies. Can you believe my daughter's second grade teacher says my daughter has a hard time summarizing things? <laughs> my son, slacker shaming me again. First, I start off with Arthur. Now that my leg sprain is healed, I want you to call me a slacker if I'm not on the treadmill in our garage every morning before you get up. And then my son says, stop making excuses, slacker. You're worse than Hillary. Beto looks better than Obama in a Speedo on transgender bathroom bands. Your girl's Shouldn't be scared because Jim identifies as Jimbalina and Jimbalina is a lady. And ladies, don't leave pee on the seat. Memo to David Brooks. He writes boring, stupid op-eds for the New York Times. Memo to David Brooks. Trump represents a moral crisis in this country. Baby boomer mom doesn't know best. Stop making excuses for being a sniveling, scruple-free, zero personality hack. You're worse than Hillary. Can I get another holla for some holla? The Constitution is at stake in 2020. Is that so, Denture Breath Pelosi? Is Babyface Omar pushing to replace it? Meaning the Constitution? Is Babyface Omar pushing to replace the Constitution with Sharia law? Ginsburg is dead. So what radical overhaul do you anticipate exactly? Is we the people... Now it changes to Sean Hannity. Can I get another holla for some holla? John Hamm from Mad Men gave Kamala Harris a $1,000 campaign donation. Is that how much he charges for a pearl necklace? Ah! Michelle Obama says Trump is making our country sick. Wrong. Your hired peon, Jesse Smollett, trying to start a race war under false, orchestrated, paid-for pretenses is what sick and twisted sister. Luke Walton on the phone with Dad. You keep on trucking, Dad. I need to replace my Grateful Dead tattoo with a Nipsey Hustle one today. If I stand any shot of getting big-time free agents to play for me and sign on the dotted line. Pharmacy. Worker at the pharmacy. I asked him, is any plan for spring break? He says, I went to Amsterdam for spring break. And I reply, the Anne Frank Museum there is enormous. I've never seen so much closet space. I expected a cubby, not a walk-in closet. Joan Rivers was jealous of her fame. Long time! DMV. State home comedian. Ban ice! Because... Homeland Security was so weapons of mass destruction years. Me being passive aggressive at the DMV after getting hate stares from illegals. If my Aussie wife had a cousin who wanted a New York driver's license, what form of ID would be required? A social security card? I guess Poncho over there is screwed then, huh? Huh? Stoner inside into Kiss. The song Beth. Would it be as depressing if Beth had children to keep her comfy, warm, and far less alone than touching herself with Ace Freely's guitar picks at home? 
calling my dad on his I don't know what your birthday. Happy birthday, dad. How have mom and Jonathan lit up your role today so far? Let me guess. They failed to capture the majestic sparkle missed from your three grandchildren over here. Home, wife, there's no pink tax on Viagra. State owned comedian says, guys aren't taking Viagra to bang out more babies, babe. For my wedding, I should have replaced my no-show whiny Jewish grandma with a wise black grandma. Post an ad on Craigslist. Wise black grandma needed. All expenses paid. Tyler Perry impersonators are welcome. Must be comfortable performing in front of a white audience only. <laughs> Can I get another holla for some holla? I wanted to do that joke at the Apollo Theater. I've been talking about it for the past year. <laughs> I'm doing my best to come to grips with what happened, folks, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. But the title of this podcast, I have no idea what number we're at, but it's called Fuck the Apollo. I don't want to say that, but the title made me laugh. And I just came back from D.C. for an extended birthday celebration. We stayed in uh, West Point at the Hyatt, and I had an amazing indoor pool experience with my children. <laughs> and... I wish every dad could have that first time experience. <laughs> uh, I mean, we always remember like the jumping on the beds and, you know, at first I was like talking trash about the hotel room and two seconds later I wanted to stay there for the entire week. <laughs> it was really special. Uh, kids really are superior company the most. So this is my daughter summarizing every fight I've ever had with my wife. Stop talking, Dada. Mama got your point mid-breath. <laughs> Can you believe, again, my daughter's second grade teacher says she's a hard time summarizing things? <laughs> so me at the barber shop before my before me waiting for my audition at the Apollo Theater for Amateur Night before I decided to leave and walk away. Say no comedian at the barber shop. And I decided I was gonna actually gonna open up with this joke because it got such a big reaction. And I wasn't even planning on it. Say no comedian. I love the NBA when it didn't exist as a safe space for LeBron James' ego. Ha! <laughs> Barber laughs a long time. This is going to be number two because the open cattle call for the Apollo was actually on 420. This is Ziggy Marley being interviewed by High Times Magazine on 420. Ziggy, your father had 12 kids, but I thought weed, drain your ball sack dry, Stripping your life shooter of any baby making power altogether. And Ziggy Marler replies, Fake news, man. <laughs> my resistor mother is my impersonation of her. Responding to a bunch of picture perfect photographs that I took of her grandchildren in her nation's capital. Here we go. My resistor mother is my impersonation of her in a reaction to these photos. I like the picture with the three kids by the reflector pool. And of course, the one with you and the three kids. That picture that she's referring to was in front of the White House. <laughs> My mom can't even utter the White House in the same breath as her grandchildren. <laughs> I reached a conclusion. I was able to meet up with an old bud from, from college. We had a nice time in uh, South Street in Philly. And had a great cheesesteak there. Got a little nauseous afterwards, but it was totally worth it. <laughs> Didn't last that long. I think it's because I wouldn't call my body a temple, but I had been rocking the pescatarian diet as a whole, and it was great. I was also extremely hungover from the previous night. <laughs> Drank a lot of whiskey for my extended birthday uh, celebration. But again, it wasn't planned. i become like that guy that over that becomes over-reliant on using Yelp to discover like new neighborhood spots. Definitely better to uh, trust your instinct. And always, you know, look in the window for... You know, stickers, best of, you know, any newspaper clippings, you know, trust your instincts. My point being, do stuff that's spontaneous and not always overplanned. Most places usually work out better in the end. So, I had a good time with my friend Dave. He's doing really well. And he's been sober for like six months now, so I'm really proud of him. So, I got into a conversation about rehab and, and the people that uh, are in there. So, this conversation inspired uh, this new joke. I've reached a conclusion I'm not a blackout alcoholic, but more of a mindful lush who understands his limitations and total lack of control if a bottle 
of high-end Kentucky bourbon is in my presence at home after nightfall. Yeah, so I don't bring it home, ever. <laughs> uh, this is me talking to my friend on South Street. My friend goes, the economy would crash without illegals. And I said, but they don't pay taxes and send all their cash back to Mexico through Western Union. And Lawnmower Man isn't racking up VR startup money either. Can I get a holla for some holla? Again, continue conversation with my friend on South Street. He says, do you believe in the alt-right? And I said, alt-right. It's a made-up term designed to silence true talkers like Islamophobia. Antifa branding themselves as the anti-fascist party. The alleged leader Milo blows black dudes, dude. <laughs> How does a Seagram heiress get involved in an upstate sex cult? I thought the Podesta brothers preferred their kiddie pool parties by the swamp. Did she own pedo artwork depicting kids with gags to make Marilyn Manson blush? This is my impersonation of a Yenta on Metro North failing at telling her friends how much she hates New York City during the summer. At least in Florida, I don't have to wear black to work. So on my way to the beach, I might get lost in a sea of MAGA hats. No big deal. It's me meeting up with an old high school associate at an Irish bar in D.C. It was less than inspiring. <laughs> he says, even if you bomb at the Apollo, it still takes balls. And I said, once an asshole, always an asshole. You can't help yourself, obviously. Also, folks, once a bully, always a bully. He tried to bully me into like calling this guy Phil that I'm not even speaking terms with anymore. Uh, you know, he hasn't addressed or acknowledged the birth of my three kids. I don't know the name of his kids, so why am I really rushing to hang out with Phil? Especially when, ages ago, when I'd set him up on a double date. He goes, I see you as more of a behind-the-scenes sort of guy. And I don't really see how being a behind-the-scenes sort of guy would translate into me racking up more than 3,000-plus downloads on this podcast. Me auditioning for a callback audition with Paul Mooney. And before me doing that, after talking to Paul, after wanting them to do with me and him passing by, by me saying, I hear you're funny. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, you could say, well, Michael, he was just saying that he views you as more of a, uh, I don't know, empty vessel to cite other people's lines, but that's not what set comedians do. Anyway, I'm not going to get into it. The point being is that this guy that I haven't seen in ages from high school, it would have been nice if my friend Jones told me that A, he was balding, wasn't prepared for that. And B, he's been working for a think tank in D.C., but for, like, teachers unions. And he says the majority of his job is lots of very tedious, like, statistical analysis. And I always viewed him as, like, a witty asshole. And his uh, his, his dumpy uh, aura was just be the antithesis of inspiring. Married, no kids. The best thing I had to say about the picture of my three kids was, I missed the snow. <laughs> Anyway, this is what this is what happens. I, I decided to talk about an old boring friend that I actually they perceived assholishness with with actual wit, and now I'm completely sucking up the flow of my podcast. So this is Lavar Ball's my coach dad growing up. Lavar Ball, as my coach dad growing up, would make sure I got the first base before my younger brother did. He'd only invite stuck up Jenny from the block for a game of spin the bottle. Two seconds into the party, he barks and. Stuck up Jenny's ear. The Yoo-Hoo bottle doesn't spin itself, bitch! I love Trump's relentless optimism. If he was diagnosed with HIV today, he tweet tomorrow, Do I have HIV? Yes. But my T-cell count numbers have never been stronger. I have created the perfect nonpartisan joke I know. Describing my endless wait for auditioning at the Apollo. Security, amateur night, Organizer workers made me feel less welcome than any designated fishbowl allocation for my mother-in-law, for myself, for Easter, or my Passover, either. <laughs> Apollo, it's me at the Apollo, the Apollo security guy. I didn't ask you that, is my response. You don't intimidate me after Paul Mooney refused to shake my hand. Sorry. Let me guess. You dream of being Steve Harvey's go-to Apollo pre-show fluffer. Can I get a holla for some holla? Describing my endless wait for addition at the Apollo. Security, amateur, night organizer, workers did their best to make me feel less welcome than Obama paying Shiva for a photo op if Netanyahu got iced. <laughs> and if Obama blamed it on an anti-Muslim video. Ah! 
describing my endless wait for auditioning at the Apollo. I've always hated waiting to perform at open mics. Not once have I shied away from putting my name first on the Sun of Bless, even when I sucked out loud for the first year and didn't get any laughs. You'd figure at the Apollo of all places, they would want to beeline me to the front so they could huck on me as soon as possible. No such luck. Describing my endless way for auditioning at the Apollo. I wasn't nervous or scared, despite being the only white boy waiting around for hours. With all the other amateur rappers, I think despite no fake gold bling, I walked away. Describing my endless wait for addition to the Apollo. Definitely the only white comedian waiting to showcase my 90 seconds of comedy gold. Reading about Justin Bieber in relation to Nipsey Hussle on Breitbart <laughs> set me off, so I walked away. Waiting for my addition to the Apollo was torture. I felt more distinguished on my fifth round of same-day interviews for an IT recruiter job at Robert Half after I got my TV writing break with VH1 and VH1 Classic. <laughs> And at least when I was working for Robert Half, I was getting paid to be a glamorized indentured servant. <laughs> so, in the Apollo, guys, I really, really wanted to perform at the Apollo. I was doing material at the barber shop. There was a medical student from Drexel, okay? Her parents didn't even know who Jim Morrison was, all right? Couldn't that have had a more uptight upbringing? And I was doing material from Delaware all the way to Penn Station. So obviously I had more than 90 seconds. And I was getting laughs from her. And I actually felt better about my past Adderall addiction. <laughs> I'm not going to act like I'm completely past it just yet. However, I asked her, so are all of you guys on Adderall? And it was the only time she got super tense. And she said no, but it was obvious that she was lying. <laughs> so it definitely it was a nice moment where uh, this stay-at-home dad uh, comedian you know, felt superior to a medical student. <laughs> Knowing she's not looking after three kids and she's not wielding the uh, comedic gold that I have or really considered a major voice in this role that Twitter feels compelled to shadow ban and, and silence. <laughs> but the books are coming out, baby! Stale comedian! Controlling my kids through comedy, Shadow Band Bucks, July 4th, baby! Bring on the pain! And we got Fall for Fatherhood, my book of essays on fatherhood. Our three kids got my act together, coming out Father's Day. Very excited. So I'm waiting for the Apollo. I'm there for two hours and change. I feel less welcome than a resurgent, totally forgot about herpes sore. That hasn't appeared in like two decades straight. <laughs> and that was fine. I actually thought, and this is takes ball, it does take balls in this instance. Is I literally thought it this the entire auditorium was packed. I'm staring at like the lucky wood. I thought literally that they were gonna test us there to see like what sort of reaction we got from like the big crowd. But it was in a different room. It took so long. And again, ugh. Oh, I just wish I could have been in and out. I went there last year and I was too late. This year I thought I was just early enough and then I had to wait forever. So my only way that I'm able to really deal with myself, because my daughter was devastated. I feel like she basically doesn't respect me anymore. <laughs> she didn't like run upstairs to kiss me today. But, so I, I will do this just to check it off the bucket list. And it'd be, actually be cooler to do it next year after the book sell and yeah, I'll definitely have a bigger mojo. And I'll just next time be prepared to like bring a book and just chill out and obviously expect the extreme attitude and, and just deal with it. I had no problem dealing with the attitude. It was just the wait. I, I had an unattended house at home. I had the perfect excuse to avoid my deadweight conversationalist mother-in-law who was in Delaware with my three kids. Not to mention the fact that I'm working with an editor – who really hasn't been like super fast so far. Uh, but she's got two other jobs. I'm not going to dig into it. I'm not going to judge. I'm grateful that she wants to help me make a name for myself. And she, I'm quoting, I'm quoting her by saying that the writing's beautiful from what she's read. From, from, and she hasn't read everything. And I do appreciate her advice about opening with the, uh, the book of essays first. So, I'm at the Apollo. And I was just thinking about 
prioritizing my time and I just don't know how much energy I would have had heading back after like waiting for two more hours only to get extreme attitude, but whatever. The bottom line is I regret not waiting it out. <laughs> I'll be blatantly honest. I could, I could spin this all I want. I should have waited. I should have shown patience. And the thing was, I wasn't even on Adderall. So like I wasn't even like antsy. But you could say that you guys have spoiled me rotten because I've been able to indulge in you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes of time with you doing these podcasts, doing a boatload of material. And this is only 90 seconds, and I just I, I wasn't in that instance ready to like dance for my dinner. Uh, and it's as if the uh, the ghost of Patrice O'Neill had like completely consumed me. And at this point, I don't really feel like an amateur either. But you know, I never. It's always been important to me to impress uh, New York black people. <laughs> Because not that I think that like they're the funniest or anything, it's just it's a New Yorker thing, you know. It's just something that I wanted to do, and then that's why I did the Paul Mooney, you know, callback. I was selling like news mining services back then, and I never shy away from the opportunity, you know, especially to do like sports jokes from the city, and I was doing that. I mean, basically, the guy at Staples was black. Uh, at the the guy at the coffee shop, I think it was Latino, and. I don't know. There were some other black guys. I, I, I was sampling material left and right, but I will do it next year. <laughs> I will definitely do it next year. And I don't plan on stopping this podcast, so I can't wait to say what happens next year. So you're just going to have to wait, <laughs> and that's the only way I can really deal with not doing it. I'm also definitely going to audition for the New York Comedy Festival this year, and I will have some merch to sell with the books. Once I kill there. So that will be nice. That will be nice. So uh, my this is my wife not helping. Her most annoying wife of all time case one bit. This is her coming back from Delaware. Now, again, I can't complain because I actually did get my full and for fathered manuscript in tip-top shape. And I started the process of getting my second book together in a separate manuscript, which I have not even had the time to do. Because I've just been cranking all this new material. I got the three kids. So... I have to think that like God made me that on edge for a reason, because in the end, I don't even. I mean, my wife could say, "Well, you know, they, they listen. They're not gonna give Mr. White Privilege, who's from Westchester County, a shot out on TV compared to some black kid that comes from nothing," which is a factual statement. I don't even know if like black people have before in the Apollo, but I wanted to be that guy. Yeah, <laughs> Rich Fawcett on Def Comedy Jam. And I'm not sweating Rich Voss, although I think Rich Voss is very funny and a great headliner. So, and his wife is named Bonnie McFarlane, something like that. And I sent her a lot of tweets a long time ago, complimenting her because I read her book, and you know she she liked a bunch of them too. So, and and I I I, I mentioned a lot of uh, great compliments that Rich Voss had uh, had made her honor. Rich Voss had actually not been telling her telling her. Uh, he had recorded her and sent that as a demo reel to HBO. And that actually uh, got her a spot on HBO, which I think is really great. And she's really good looking. So, you know, good good, good for Voss and, and Bonnie. And she, she spoke very uh, lovingly of uh, Bourdain because he did like a special in New Jersey and, and they were profiled. So anyway, the, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so point being is I wanted to be, I wanted to do my own Voss version. Obviously, I'm a too tall Jew compared to Voss, but you know what are you gonna do? All right, next year, and your comedy club. And I've decided to record instead of actually recording a audio version of the own comedian, I'm gonna do a comedy album, and we're gonna be calling it Resist This. It's gonna be my own Dennis Miller White Album, okay? But not nearly as pretentious. I'm certainly not gonna call it the White Album. We're gonna call it Resist This, or we're gonna call it Killerset at Gmail.com. Huh? Killerset, whatever. Killerset at Gmail.com. Perfection. It's an old email address of mine on Gmail. Anyone that wants to reach out to me for time's sake. The other one is uh, do it all daddy here at alec.com. That's the current one. But this album will be reflective of that elusive killer set that I've always been churning out material for. Never really had the opportunity to get that city stage time to put all in work in order. So uh, this is going to be it. So I can't wait. So again, uh, this was me 
uh, I was talking about my wife before, not helping her most annoying wife of all time case one bit. Wife calls in the speaker with my three kids. And she's coming back from Delaware. She says, I'm calling you to so you can keep me company for the next three hours. And I said, listen to my podcast to keep yourself company. You're only 105 behind. Can I get a holla for some holla? Stoner Insight. It's a Grateful Dead, Europe 72. Gonna miss me when I'm gone. Is a tad presumptuous, don't you think? <laughs> and my in-laws in Delaware. The moment we arrive there, it's like 11 o'clock at night. Colbert's on as I enter with my wife and three kids. I say, why is Colbert smiling anymore? Trump gutted his funny. <laughs> there are pictures on the internet with Colbert acting cozy with Podesta, for Christ's sake. <laughs> if Stephen Colbert was John Stewart funny, I wouldn't mind the unfunny Trump jokes. There's another conversation with my friend on uh, South Street. You're walking around. He says, Antifa isn't a terrorist organization. And I said, Tucker Carlson's wife hid in the closet in a sea of dirty Vineyard Vines boxers as Antifa tried to ram through their front door in our nation's capital, no less. What type of person desecrates a Buddhist temple besides a reincarnated jihadist? But babyface Omar is the new golden child. I want the knife to backstab every two-faced Jew on the planet. Post on her insight into warrants, big talk. Big talk is cheap. Unless you back it up. And we're backing it up. Unless you're Elizabeth Warren pushing for impeaching Trump based on charges with less solid footing than her claims to own moccasins of any kind. This is the Do It All Dad Your Podcast. What Gen X parents understand. Dad friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids with comedy. Can make our kids great again. I miss pleasing you all. And I will talk to you guys soon.